This is the story of God's power moving in the life of just one individual. It shows how God can bring healing, wholeness and hope out of confusion and despair. It is a testimony to God's love, grace and forgiveness towards those in greatest need. And it's the story of how God can minister through one life to bring new life and freedom to countless others. I was born in a foreign country. My father was in the army, which is why I was in this country. And uh, my mother had twin girls. And in the area where I was born, it was a disgrace to have a girl. And so my mother had to go along in order to keep the staff with this, uh, what she would call, uh, ridiculous goings on. She didn't uh, believe in anything spiritual, but this was in fact a spiritual occasion as far as the staff was concerned, because it was um, the evil spirits from the older twin being put in the younger twin, a curse of death put on the younger twin, the younger twin would die, and then only one girl would be in that home, and that would be less of a disgrace, and the staff would then stay on. So my mother agreed to this. I didn't know anything about it. I happened to be the younger twin. And at the age of three, we came over from the foreign country to England, where my father had inherited a large family home, 15-bedroomed house, lots of grounds, tennis courts, croquet lawns, lakes, perfect. But on the inside, it wasn't so perfect. It was a haunted house. So fear was quite, a, quite an emotion I experienced at a very young age. And my parents, although I appreciate all they did in bringing me up and... Uh, uh, really gave us all that they could possibly give in um, uh, providing uh, social life and, and lots of money and lots of uh, uh, good things happening. But underneath there was a problem that my parents didn't actually communicate very well and my mother was an alcoholic and uh, people coming into the home would think this is great, wonderful, big house, big oak table, 25 having dinner, parties, um, barbecues, wonderful occasion but you see it wasn't so wonderful because as soon as everyone left my father would go up back stairs and my mother would go up the front stairs they lived in separate ends of the house virtually own bedrooms separate bedrooms separate uh, kitchens and i think that was their, their way of being able to cope with the situation uh, i remember asking my mother once uh, why did she marry my father and she said oh i felt sorry for him he'd had a motorbike accident and he was bandaged from head to toe and I, then I remember asking, why didn't you sleep together? And she said, because my father eats Mars bars at night, and I don't. I like reading. And I remember being very confused at an early age on what was going on. We went to a primary school. The primary school wasn't a great success um, in the sense that uh, we were truly, cruelly treated there. My um, um, memories, really, was taking a big teddy bear on the bus and having to pay a penny for it. But I took the teddy bear to keep me company because uh, the teacher was cruel, she'd beat us, she'd uh, um, not really look after us. We were only four, four and a half, and eventually she went into prison for cruelty. Went to another school which was uh, slightly better, um, but not, I wasn't happy at school. I seized up, I couldn't really concentrate, I was worried about what was happening at home, because meanwhile my grandfather came to live with us, and he had a bad heart. So we were always warned not to make a noise in case he died so there was this sort of guilt that we might be responsible for his death i'm not sure if my twin sister felt that but i certainly felt that and my grandmother moved in and she was blind and a great aunt who was quite neurotic and uh, so the house was full of invalids and it was full of tension and a full of an alcoholic mother and um, i didn't really settle there and at age eight i remember sitting on a stile thinking there just isn't a god because I couldn't understand why my father went on Sunday to one church and my mother went to another. And uh, it didn't seem to fit. And I couldn't see the God of love. And I couldn't see that God had any um, impact on what was going on in our home. And so at eight I decided there's no God. And uh, I went away to a boarding school. The boarding school, I was a good school, but we never learned anything. I say we because I always felt that my twin sister and myself did things together in, in the way that we were in the hockey team together, we uh, swam together, we played tennis together, she was captain of one team and I was captain of the other. But at the same time, the learning was a problem because what was happening at home was my concern. Had my grandfather died? Was my mother drunk? Who was emptying the hot water bottles? Because I used to go around the house emptying her hot water bottle of whiskey 
going up the drive and finding bottles of gin and tipping them onto the grass. And uh, so I felt responsible. And then there was a phone call one day. And because we didn't mix very closely with people, a lot of social life, but not really friends, um, except for this one friend who was a friend of my mother's, and it was her son that used to come and sit and chat with us while my mother played bridge with her. And this boy um, was away at school as well. And there was a phone call to say that he'd been... Um, just died. He put his head um, on a railway line and he'd been um, decapitated. I was devastated. I didn't know whether to laugh or to cry or to believe it or not believe it. And I went back and uh, into the um, dormitory and I r realized then that this boy had died. It hit me very strongly and I wanted to know what was death. But I just went through the rest of that term in a complete haze. I couldn't think, I couldn't... Uh, I really understand why he should have done it. Got home at the end of the term, my mother met us off the station, um, off the train, and into the car we got. And as we got into the car, she just said, this girl who used to ride our horses when we were away had died. So I asked her how, and she, oh, she put a bullet through her head, she committed suicide. So I went home in a sort of cloud of despair, really, and decided to find out what was death. And I went to the local library the next day, and I went into all the books I could find to see what was death. Um, and this was the start of pursuing the question and wanting to know what the answer was, what was death. Went back to school, had to leave school because I had an operation on my leg. And I was told I couldn't go back to school. For a while I needed a governess at home and medically I couldn't go back. And I didn't want a governess because I knew I wouldn't learn anything. I knew I was going back into the situation of a mother not really um, sober and a father who wasn't a communicator, and up to the attic rooms with a governess and to the haunted area of the house. And I just couldn't cope with the idea of it, but it had to happen. And during this year, um, things were really quite bad for me emotionally and my response to the home situation. And I'm sure I responded perhaps worse than uh, the rest of the family. And um, it's the response that was wrong rather than what was going on in the home. And um, I found that in that year, this big question, what was death, was absolutely uppermost in my mind. And towards the end of the year, I wrote off to hospitals, um, because I thought hospital is the place you find out about death. It's no good writing to Woolworths or to a peanut factory, you must go to a hospital. So I wrote off to various hospitals, and I um, asked for interviews. And I got interviews, and I decided um, that I'd go for three days, but I wouldn't tell them. Because I only needed three days, day one to get there, day two to find out what was death, and day three to leave. And they accepted me, but I had to wait. So I wrote back to one of the hospitals, and I asked them if I could um, perhaps um, start early, explain the situation at home, and uh, they agreed that I could start early. And I was very grateful of that, because during that uh, last few weeks at home, my grandfather had died and he died in my arms and my mother wasn't able to handle the situation because she was actually drunk and so I found that a terrible trauma to me because all of a sudden I was confronted with my own grandfather dying perhaps this was the answer I'd get the answer what was death and I didn't but I put it down to the fact that I was emotionally disturbed by his death and I was worried about my mother who wanted him dressed and couldn't accept that he was dead and um, therefore the hospital would give me the answer. So this hospital, teaching hospital, accepted me and I started. And I went up and day one I was really quite excited because I thought today is the first day, tomorrow is the answer and the next day I'm going, I'm leaving. So I got into this little clinical room, nice envelope, cornered beds, uh, smelling of uh, disinfectant and next morning got up put on this uniform thinking this is a bit of a waste of time because I won't need it for very long but I perhaps better conform went down to the um, teacher training school and listened to a tutor just telling me about bandages and bedpans and uh, enemas and in the corner there was a skeleton hanging in the corner and that was Jimmy and Jimmy we had to be introduced to and I didn't realize that for six weeks I was going to have to sit at this table and listen to this tutor and uh, not find out about death. And each day, I kept expecting this answer. And then in that time, out of boredom really, because I wasn't called to be a nurse or dedicated. In fact, um, I was a bit squeamish really. And 
so I got diverted. And I got diverted really because my grandmother had taught me how to read palms and how to do telepathy and she'd got me involved in uh, occult things really. And during this um, training school, six weeks, I got involved in that and I started reading palms. And there was one girl that I turned to and I said to her, in three weeks, three days or three um, hours, or three months even, exactly, um, a member of your family is going to die and it's going to be a male member. And I suddenly thought, why did I say that? And three weeks to the very day, in fact, to the very hour, her father dropped dead. And I suddenly thought, goodness, this is spooky. And I realized I was into a power I hadn't uh, understood I'd got or, or where it had come from. And I was quite scared by that. And after six weeks up on the wards, then that would be the answer. What was death? First patient was going to die. I was really excited. In fact, we knew that patient was going to die and I couldn't sleep the night before because I thought uh, it was going to be so exciting. And then I hoped it would be in the morning because if it was in the morning, then I could leave in the afternoon. And the patient did die in the morning. And I just stood by her and I thought, where's the answer? No answer. And I was quite devastated. So I just walked off the ward, walked into the city, went round the city. I just went to anybody who'd got a Bible, a dog collar, anyone who looked as if they might have the answer, what was death? And it was a Sunday and I stood outside by a wall. In fact, I sat on the wall of this large church and I just said, could you tell me what death is, please? And none of them told me. And I went back onto the wards and I was changed from the medical ward into um, another ward, which was the intensive care unit. And I walked into the sluice and I thought, the world's crazy. It's absolutely crazy. You can't even answer what is death. And so I decided, mainly because I was depressed and morose and uh, negative, and I couldn't see the point in living on planet Earth with these people, because they were all dotty. If they couldn't answer a question, what was the point in wasting my time with it? So I decided coolly and calmly and wanted just really to just finish life off. And so I um, decided to raid the dangerous drug cupboard and take the pills and to slash my wrists. So I did that and I waved goodbye to the world. <laughs> and my last memory was blood going under a door and I thought, this is it, I'm going to experience death. Nobody can answer the question I'll experience. And I woke up and I suppose my first thought was, this is death. My second uh, memory of waking up was pain because my arms were all stitched up. I can't recall them stitching me or anything like that, no bandages and wires. And I was in a room that's about six foot long and about four foot wide. And there was just a mattress on the floor. No bed clothes, no pillows, nothing, just a mattress. And uh, there I was, and I didn't know where I was. And there was no window, a little skylight and a little beam of light. I suppose a beam is the best expression. Was it day, was it night? I didn't know. And there was no door. I couldn't see a handle of a door or anything. But there was a little, teeny little peephole. And I went to look into, up into this peephole, but I couldn't reach it. So I must have been sunken down somewhere. And um, soon, seemed like a long time, but I'm sure it wasn't too long, there was a sound. And I heard my first sound, which was water coming down a pipe in a corner of the room. There must have been a pipe behind the corner. And then the second sound was the sound of keys jangling. And then a section of the door, a wall opened, which clearly was a door, but there was no handle on the inside. And these two nurses came in and they put me on the mattress. They injected me, not a word was spoken, and out they went. And then the section of this wall closed, and then the sound of keys. I realized I was locked in. And I was in there with thoughts of my own of anger because I was still alive. Um, where was I? I didn't know, nobody told me. I was just being fed pills. I was on 36 pills a day, and I was just being injected and fed. And uh, 
17 months I stayed in isolation. And then after that they moved me and they moved me into another ward. But during that time in, in the locked room my thinking was uh, a bit obscure looking back but I was having a relationship with the cobweb. I was uh, hearing voices, I was uh, really sort of feeling the air was polluted and um, that every sound was an interference into the think my thinking and I, I felt emotions of anger and loneliness and isolation and I didn't have an, anyone to talk to. You see, I wasn't allowed visitors at this point and I wasn't allowed uh, books or paper to write or magazines or television or radio. So it was quite a, a silent existence. And then after the um, entrance into the four-bedded ward, which is after 17 months where they put me, which was uh, four, three other people and myself, that was a culture shock because there were people to relate to, there were people who were making a noise, there were sound of breathing at night, and a, cu a culture shock, I think, would be the only way of explaining it. Yeah. And I was put in there in order to have further treatments because the drug treatment on its own wasn't working. And so they started treatments. Treatments being narcosis. Narcosis treatment is, uh, well, it's a strange treatment. They give you a prialdehyde drug, a strong drug. They put you in a corner of this four-bedded uh, ward in a sort of darkened area, cubby hole off it, on a mattress on the floor, and uh, the drug sedates you heavily. You're incontinent, you're just very dopey. They wake you up and feed you, and then you go back to sleep. The idea being it jogs your brain out of depression or out of wrong thinking, and I was also violent, which is why I've been under lock and key, and uh, this treatment, they said, would work. Well, three weeks you, you go on like this daily with this uh, drug, and then you come out of it, and if it's worked, that's fine. If not, you go into it again. And it hadn't worked, so I had it again. And then it didn't work. Uh, that didn't work. So they started electric uh, shock treatment, and I had 39 of those in sections of six and then nine, and that didn't work. And so they gave me insulin treatment. Actually, I'm not sure why I had insulin treatment, but I had it, and that didn't work. And so they would uh, really spelled out to me that th the treatments weren't working. And after a few uh, years now, they decided to take me down to occupational therapy. And I was quite relieved to hear that, because, you see, it was a locked set-up, and uh, there was always security with you. There was always a nurse with you, and you couldn't walk across the... Ward. Ward sounds too big a uh, name, really, because it was four times the size of six by four, so it wasn't that big. But you couldn't walk across the room without the nurse or the security with you. The um, locked situation meant no two locked doors could be open at the same time. And a buzzer would go to indicate someone was coming in, and the door would be locked. Um, and as soon as the buzzer went off, it could be open, which meant the outer door was locked. And so this one day, they uh, strapped you in, a, in the corner of this room while the doors were being unlocked and they came in to fetch me. And I was going off with security to occupational therapy. It wasn't strange for me to go with security because I couldn't have a bath without a nurse present and I couldn't go to the loo without a nurse present. I couldn't walk across the room. So it wasn't strange to have them take me. But it was strange because it was my first time through three to four locked doors before standing on the entrance of this hospital. And that was because the shed where they had the occupational therapy was across the grounds of the hospital. So I stood there and the sensation of the wind on my face and the light and uh, all that sort of thing was really, was really strange. And I stood on the steps of this hospital and I realized what it was. I was in a high security wing of a psychiatric hospital and there was a large wall all around the grounds and barbed wire rolled up around the top of that wall. And it just hit me, just as the air hit my face, really. It just hit me. I am in here, and I'm in security. And the uh, nurses took me across this patch of grass, a sort of uh, path of grass to this hut. And as I walked down this grass, I realized there was a gap, a very thin gap in this wall. And I wanted to shoot through the gap, and I was under five stone then, and I thought I'd get through, but I couldn't break away from them. So I went into the hut, went to occupational therapy, back across the grounds and I thought next time I'll go through that gap but you see I didn't know when next time would be it could be tomorrow it could have been in six months it could have been in a year you just knew when the light went on and they came to fetch you and so the next time I did I shot through the gap I escaped from them and I hadn't catered for what would happen 
I got through the gap and I just ran for a few yards and then I just froze on the edge of the pavement. I couldn't cope with the sound of cars, I couldn't cope with what I was, I was doing out there, where was I going, and I just froze with fear on the edge of this pavement and it seemed like a very short time a police car came up and uh, it was got the light flashing and it just screeched to a halt by me. And two policemen got out and one uh, handcuffed me and they put me in the back with the one I was handcuffed to and they just drove round and back through the main gates of the hospital. Well, I was paranoid. I thought everybody was talking about me and everyone hated me and um, everyone was plotting to, to do things to me. And so that just fed my paranoia because why me? In this big city, why me? And why did the policeman, when he got out of the car, say Liesel and then my maiden name? How did he know? And I got quite disturbed by that. But he took me into the ward and through the locked doors up into the ward. And the pattern was this every time. Every time I escaped, the police seemed to find me. And I got bolder. And I found different methods of escaping, either um, down the laundry chute or I'd hide in the grounds and then I'd uh, go through the gap. And uh, every time, wherever I was, whether I was at the top of the city or the bottom of the city, they found me. And I couldn't understand why until one day they uh, took me into the ward and the uh, psychiatrist was there and he said we want to speak with you and I was taken into this room with a whole lot of nurses and doctors and policemen and psychiatrists and he spelt out to me the problem. You see up until then everybody else had got the problem. The world was crazy, they all needed treatment, I was the only sane one really walking the planet and there was this psychiatrist uh, bashing his fist on the table and saying, Lisa will you stop this running away? This is your home for life. You're sectioned, you're under court order and you're got to accept that uh, you're not going to leave this building. And the sooner you accept that and stop this running away, the easier for us and the easier for you. And uh, every time you run away, the police legally um, can bring you back. And it's been through court and you're sectioned. And I just, those words just ran through me and said, something in me said, no way, no, I can't live here for life. And uh, the adrenaline got going in me. I don't know what happened, but I suddenly thought, I've got to die. How do I do it? How do I do it successfully? And on the next escape, I was walking down the road and I just saw um, a hippie, really. He was got long hair and bare feet and beads all over him and I just uh, walked across the road. Why I walked across the road, I don't know, because I used to stand for anything up to an hour trying to cross the road. I mean, just paralysed with fear, I couldn't cross the road. But this occasion, I was more or less propelled across the road and I just went up to him and I just said, have you any drugs? And he said, what do you take? Well, my mind went to spin. Well, I was in a spin anyway, but more of a spin, because I thought, what do I take? 36 pills a day. And suddenly I just said, amphetamines. And I don't know why I said amphetamines, because I worked on casualty, had no patience with the drug addicts. I used to think, pull yourself together, don't do this to your families. And all of a sudden there was me saying amphetamines. I didn't know why. He said, meet you at the ship cafe at half past two. So half past two, I hid until half past two met him, he handed over a handful of black bombers, they were known as your black um, amphetamines, no money, no, no exchange of money, and I just took the whole lot. Nobody said how many to take, and I floated up there somewhere. And everything was wonderful. Why was I depressed? Why was I crying? Why did I want to die? How stupid. The world is wonderful. All on fire, a handful of these black bombers, but so dangerous, so evil. You know, those set me off on the black market drug um, 